Thank you very much for having me for your Scholars in Aging lecture series. Um, next slide will show my disclosures. So this work was funded by the Alzheimer's Association International Research Grant Program, the um, AARG slash D, which is Alzheimer's Association Research Grant to promote diversity. And additional funding came from the University of Georgia Office of Service Learning. All right. So here is our agenda for today. Um, I just want to give you a sense of what to expect. I'm going to give some background on the community partnership you heard in my introduction. Thank you very much. Um, in my bio that I embed my work with combining service learning coursework. And so you're going to hear about that today. Um, and so why do I embed this work into community partnerships? Why caregiving? Give some information um, about background of caregiving in the U.S. And then also provide some evidence for respite. So I'm going to present two studies that will eventually circle us around to the question on the first slide. Is virtual respite a thing? And you're like, a thing? That's not very academic. But truly, that's how the question came to me. So I'm going to talk about where all of this came from. And um, if you could bear with me, we're kind of tag teaming here. Thank you very much um, um, because we couldn't get this in presenter mode. Next, next slide. Thank you very much. So um, here's what you can expect. The work I'm going to present today is a proof of concept. And if you know in intervention research, particularly intervention research involving caregivers or caregiver, care partner, care receiver, dyads, Proof of concept studies have several features and benefits, okay? So first, when you are proposing something that's innovative, right, some innovative approach to treatment delivery, then a proof of concept study can be very important for providing evidence for implementation factors such as acceptability, feasibility. And so in my case, I am proposing to deliver respite in a virtual format. And that sounds like, how can we do that? But I'll show you that today. And also, you can have much smaller sample sizes in, again, a proof of concept study. So don't be scandalized when you see my numbers. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Proof of concept studies can also help you determine your methodology and refine your protocol. So, in other words, when you are introducing a new intervention, when you're trying something totally innovative, again, you're just trying to figure out how it works. And so you want to understand what it might look like in a larger trial. So before you take it to scale and test it, you want to do these things first. You want to figure out what would recruitment look like? What might retention look like? What factors do I need to attend to? And also, what about data collection, right? How would this, how would this look? Um, and so this is all proof of concept. To get you to the point where you are justifying a larger definitive trial. And so by trial, we just mean we're taking it to scale. So we want to test it with a larger group, maybe multiple sites multiple community partners with more people. And also, a proof of concept study can help you kind of estimate your preliminary effect sizes, right? So that's just a way of saying, what is the impact of the intervention on select outcomes? So I'm sure um, this year in your Scholars in Aging program, when you're talking about older adults and their caregivers, you're probably talking about things like, well, um, well-being, quality of life, um, for caregivers, it could be burden, it could be um, depression. So these type of outcomes that you might have of interest, we want to promote well-being, right? That's what social workers do. So proof of concept is just kind of testing the waters, so to speak. So next slide, please. My research lives, eats, sleeps, and breathes in community engagement, right? So. Um, I identify as an engaged scholar, and that basically means that I integrate the work I do at the university with community 
um, interests, with communities, partners, you know, putting them first to solve their own problems. And so we work in partnerships, and these partnerships are intended to be mutually beneficial, right? So we work together sort of to solve the world's problems, to solve the community's problems. And this is very intuitive to me as a social worker. I don't think that I could do this job in any other way um but engaging community partners it is a lot of fun to me and i'm very fortunate to have a wonderful community partner in athens the athens community council on aging if any of them are on the webinar thank you thank you thank you um they're so fantastic so this is just from their website showing you a little bit about what they do of course they have the long-term care ombuds program adult day health meals on wheels uh, they also have a care give, uh, grandparents raising grandchildren program, and that's just touching the surface. They serve 27 counties in Georgia. They provide services to almost 17,000 individuals, and they engage more than 200 volunteers. So just a wonderful, yeah. wonderful agency. And um, at the end, I can talk a little bit about, you know, what that might look like if some of you are thinking about going into research and engaging partners. What sort of that song and dance is like to engage partners into your to your work? Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I saw here at UConn that there is um, an office of outreach and engagement and service learning. Take advantage of this office if this is the type of work that you are interested in. So my partnership began with um, through the office of service learning at university of georgia we have a service learning fellows program it's a year-long program for faculty who are interested in designing service learning courses and in my case sort of sparking a partnership for community engaged research right so in other words say you want to be like dating you want to be introduced to someone right so in my case i wanted to be introduced to a community partner who might have inner interest in the work that i'm doing this year-long program helped me to do that um and also what's so great about this is I saw for UConn, there's already a list of community partners who are ready and willing to work with you, which I think is fantastic. Um, because sometimes community partners that in terms of proximity are close to university setting, they're used to being approached all the time by us academics and we make promises and we want to work with them and then we kind of fell out. And that's not how the model works. That's actually not how it should work. It is engagement, mutually beneficial. Again, just like just like dating. I could not see this happening unless I was training the future workforce. Again, my commitment to this profession and to aging, aging research, um, and aging practice was I wanted to be in a room with social workers who were social work students, social work trainees who were interested in working with this population. And so service learning, that's essentially what service learning is, educational opportunities for students. And you see this bottom bullet, it's the integration of teaching, of service, and of research. So integrating all three of those things. Next slide. So I'm sure you're familiar with these slides, um, the information on this slide. My interest is in, of course, caregiving, and particularly caregivers who have experienced dementia, right? Who um, there's dementia in the family system. So caregivers who are taking care of or providing partnership with a person who has been um, diagnosed with dementia, which is the second leading cause of death in the U.S. It affects over 6 million adults. The caregivers, there are more than 11 million family caregivers in the US, and those numbers are probably underestimated. Um, their value of care is, is $339.5 billion. So in other words, if we were to attach dollars to the work that they're doing in the homes or, or caring for someone, that is the value of their care. And I will say that caregiving we know Plus benefits, right? A lot of times caregivers report positive outcomes like the, you know, being able to give back or care for someone who once cared for them, if it's a parental, um, if it's a parent who they're caregiving for. 
But also we do know that caregiving can be burdensome. It could have high emotional, physical, and economic burden, reduced quality of life, and sometimes poor health. We even know that caregivers were, will forego their own health care um, as a result of their caregiving role, right? So I'm taking mom to appointments, I'm doing these things, and I don't have time to care for myself. So caregiver self-care is very important. Um, so this particular is actually about 10 years old. Um, it's probably a little bit better, but still not the best, which is why you are in this classroom and I'm so excited. But recruiting social workers into general, a lot of times it happens on you graduate, you know, you're in the workforce and you're realizing that in nearly every setting you're encountering older adults. But no, in my case, I didn't undergo any geriatrics or gerontology training when I was an MSW student. And so I didn't understand the uniqueness of older adults. I didn't understand sort of what were some of the unmet needs of older adults and their caregivers. And so I kind of had to back that up, you know, as a PhD student to get that training at that time. So you're in a good place because truly any setting you go to, you will encounter older adults and their caregivers. We know from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that the projected growth in this field is about 14% between now and up to um, the year 2030. But I think, again, I think that there will be even a greater need. And there's lots of research that speaks to sort of the workforce being under-trained in allied health to work with this population. So we need more of you to commit to coming into um, this field, but we know that there's about a shortage right now of about 150,000 social workers who can go directly into this workforce. Okay, next slide. You've probably seen this before, Caregiving in the U.S. They released a report every, I think it's five years, so 2015, and this came out in 2020. What was interesting, um, what else happened in 2020? The pandemic, right? And so it's interesting because when this came out, it's, it's, it's just that shut down and it's like, oh, these numbers will immediately look different, right? And so it would be inter interesting to see what the report in 2025 will reveal in terms of the caregiving experience. But just between 2015 and 2020, um, so this is interesting. So for example, the average age of black caregivers was 44 in 2015, now it's 47, and an average week, they provided 26.8 hours of care. Now, by now, um, in 2020, it was 31.2, and then they assisted with 1.8 ADLs. What are the ADLs? Activities, Activities of daily living. Now, 2.1, and the same thing for IADLs. So we've seen what that tells you is sort of an increase in the type of care, the amount of care, um, the time of care for caregivers, right? And so, again, really thinking that the pandemic has um, exacerbated the experience of caregivers in the U.S. Okay, next slide. So what does that mean? That means caregivers really require some self-care. It is important for caregivers to take time for themselves because caregivers experience a number of stress stressors that increase the need for self-care. Again, they're more likely to not have health, health insurance, to forego health care, to require psychological and social services, to require help from all of you. Uh, to experience increased risk for depression and activities of uh, limitations themselves, right? Um, we also know that they are at risk of being unemployed or underemployed because of their caregiving role. So, oh, I got to leave work early because I have to, you know, take mom to an appointment sort of thing. Uh, so the risk of underemployment and unemployment is there, which again, then affects their earning potential. Caregivers truly need time for self-care, a process of purposeful engagement in practices that promote holistic health and well-being of the self. Caregivers, as I said, often neglect their own health. Um, black and brown caregivers experience the added stress of racism and discrimination, which is, again, just the burden intensifies. And how do we create self-care? How do we create opportunities for self-care? Next slide, please. 
We can do so through respite. Respite. Anyone have a definition for respite? Yeah. <laughs> It's like giving caregivers a break. Typically, at least in my experience, it's about five ish days or so, but it can be longer than that. But it's so that way other people will care for yeah. whoever. So that way the caregiver can get a break. Yes, yes. So for those of you in the webinar, it was the answer, which is absolutely right, spot on giving caregivers a break. Um, and you said in your case, five days would be good. And what's interesting, I'm so glad that you said that because what's interesting is we actually really don't know specifically the dose of respite that relates to output. Like, what, how much respite can I give you and you and you? How much respite actually makes a difference in your caregiver caregiving experience? Is it five days a week? Is it one day a week? Is it one hour? Is it several hours? We actually don't quite know what that sweet spot is just yet, but we do know from um, research, from the empirical literature, we do know that respite does matter. So yes, it's time to engage in other responsibilities, maybe participate in some uh, health care activity, or excuse me, some self-care activity, fewer employment disruptions, and then a decrease in burden. Those are some of the benefits of um, respite. But unfortunately, respite services can be inaccessible due to cost, it's expensive. Sometimes the wait lists are super long, right, for respite. In my hometown, I'm, um, uh, I'm not, I was actually born just down the street at you know, University Hospital. Um, lived here until I was eight, but my hometown in North Carolina is very small, very rural, and there's one volunteer agency that provides respite breaks. They'll give you like two days a week for a couple of hours, and the wait list is super long to be part of that, right? And so it can be very inaccessible, sometimes non-existent in a community, right? Sometimes communities can be very under-resourced as is when it comes to um, community resources, and so respite may not exist. So, study one, um, these are the citations for study one. I'm going to talk to you about this program that I designed to offer respite to caregivers that involves students. It was so fantastic. <laughs> and then we're going to get into, again, that first slide. Can we do this virtually? Hmm. So, um, let's go to the next slide, House Guest. So this is the program. The program is called House Guest, right? It was it was intended to be like I wanted to deinstitutionalize the words, right? So it's about a friendly visitor coming to your home and just listening and allowing you an opportunity to take a break. So I designed a course, and I'm going to talk about the course in detail in just a moment. But I designed a course where um, students in my course would learn about the caregiving experience, learn about aging in the U.S. and global aging, learn about ways that social workers can um, sort of fill in the gaps, can enter the workforce, can um, provide care for older adults and their caregivers, and that's the entire course, right? Just just that. And, and again, I'll talk more about what were some of the topics in the course in just a moment. But then I said, okay, let's take it a step further. Now, remember, I told you I was in the Service Learning Fellowship. That's where I designed this course. I had to learn what it would look like to ask students to consider going into the homes of families affected by dementia. Now, I'm, I'm sure my colleagues are thinking, what, sending students? In? Because it's, a, it's, a huge, it's risky, right? It's risky, but also like you're being graded and what does that look like? Um, but it's, so I paired students um, based on their interests. So maybe two students both were interested, in, maybe they played instruments, right? And so that gave them sort of a synergy. And, and then I paired the two students with a family. My community partner, who I showed you earlier, they were able to help me identify families, right? And so they were said, oh, oh gosh, you're going to, you know, design a program like this? Yes, we have some folks. Here's a list of people who would truly love to um, engage in a program like this. And so they, the student pairs were then paired with the family, 
and they provided what was intended to be 19 minutes of respite because in the literature, there's um, some sense of, of about an hour and a half per visit would make a difference. And they were asked to do up to six visits in that semester. So 90 minutes, six visits. You talk to your family and you schedule these visits. What works for them? It was very much family centered, very much family driven. Um, can you come on Saturday morning? Uh, can you come on Thursday evening? Now, again, imagine if I was introducing you to a course where I'm asking you to, to do something like this. I'll tell you what some of the lessons learned were in a moment. Now, we as caregivers to design a visit plan. Caregivers may not think about what they need until you ask them, hey, if two students were to come to engage your person, your loved one, with um, the person experiencing dementia and some type of tailored activity, what would you do in that time? We really pushed and prompted caregivers to think about that. So they would design a self-care plan, right? And also we gave them some educational materials. We had educational materials to give them to understand caregiving, which they also appreciated very much. And so the Taylor activities, it's just so brilliant. I'll show you some of what, what they came up with. But the Taylor activities were students getting to know the family and the caregiver would offer information like, well, you know, he traveled his whole life or oh, he used to sing in the choir or, oh, she, you know, um, played the piano. And so we're listening about that person's interest because personhood of value in social work. Remember, just because someone experiences dementia doesn't mean that they lose personhood at all. It doesn't mean that they can't make a contribution. And so um, we designed the visit plan such that the caregiver says, OK, I will choose to do this thing while the students are engaging my person and take my break. And it ended up being a fantastic fantastic experience. So I'm going to show you some of what happens. Go to the next slide. Um, so the, the courses were from 2015 to 2017. I did like three iterations of the pool, of the course. Now, the course was called Dementia Caregiving. But when I taught gerontological social work, I just took the Dementia Caregiving stuff and put it into that space. So in other words, when I taught it in the summer, I was able to kind of just keep it dementia specific. But when I taught general social work, that it was a little bit more broad, but I still embedded that content into the course. Recruitment from my wonderful community partner. This is up to 90 minutes. And so after caregivers went through the experience, we then interviewed them to say, OK, let's hear about how it went. What was your experience like? And uh, um, we coded the data thematic analysis. I won't get into that too much, but in your research courses, you probably learned about, you know, how do I look at qualitative data and make sense of it? You're basically deriving themes from that data to determine sort of what happened here. Okay, and our participant. So um, we had seven completers in the program. We, so we did have, so I told you three iterations. We did have families who were returners. Right, they loved it so much. They were like, please don't leave. When you teach the course again, I want you to come back. So it's really easy to do. Um, and here were the demographics. We had um, three months providing care. We had one daughter who had been, and I have this in months, providing care for 117 months, right? So a little bit over six years. This is the youngest person. And the age of the care receiver. Um, range from 62 up to, let's see, 92. Yep. Okay. Now, here's what came from, again, the coding of the, the data, the coding of the um, qualitative data. We went into the data and we identified three things and um, we have some sub themes here. So caregiver needs, the care recipient needs, and the perception of the program materials. So I want to talk a little bit about what, before you go to the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit about what each theme means. So first, respite from the caregiving role. All caregivers identified respite as an unmet need um, or the need to take a break. 
Many describe being exhausted due to the time and energy um, of the intensive responsibilities of providing care. Some of them describe being socially isolated as a result of their caregiving role. And also many of them experience um, psychological distress, such as depression or stress, all of which supported the need for respite. Second, um, information on caregiving strategies. So the caregivers greatly appreciated what we call the pre-respite education workshops. We gave them a lot of educational materials um, where it was a brief introduction to understand dementia and caregiving strategies, which some of them had not had before. They particularly loved um, a book we gave them. This was by um, Dr. Laura Gitlin. It's a book called um, A Caregiver's Guide to Dementia. Love, love, love that book. And each of them received a copy. Costs came up frequently. Caregivers commented on the unaffordable costs um, of respite services and that they wouldn't have participated in the house guest program if there was a cost to them. So how can we keep respite services cost down? Related to the care recipient needs, the program provided an opportunity for them to socialize. I will give my favorite example. There was um, one man who um, lived with dementia and his wife talked about how, you know, he wanders and um, he gets agitated. But when she calls them the girls, when the girls were out here, yes, when the girls were out here, he just like was totally engaged the whole time. And that's because the activity was tailored. Guess what? Not everyone wants to play bingo, <laughs> right? People want their activities to be tailored to the person. And, when, and she told us all about his background and the students were like, hmm, okay. They designed, they're so smart. So they designed this program where they had, um, Printed cards of Motown. That's a music you know, Motown. Okay. Motown artists. And they put it in front of them. Who is this? Oh my goodness. You know, that's James Brown. And this was someone who his wife told us doesn't even remember his children's name at times. But he knew those artists. And then they would take their iPhone, right? We carry our lives on these little computers. And they would play the song and he would sing the whole song. Now imagine that. And she was watching like what you know engaged the whole time that gave her an opportunity to take a break and i'm going to show you a picture of what she did something that she told me she'd been wanting to do for years and hadn't got a chance to do so i'm going to show you a picture in just a moment um, let's see what else um, they also described the tailored activities as being a fit with the person's interest the person's functional status and their cognitive level they appreciated the thought behind developing the tailored activities and most important, adjusting when it was appropriate. So we had one lady who her daughter told us um, she is all about makeup and looking good. And so the students went in with a makeup kit and nail polish and all that, and they polished her nails and she was just getting pretty, getting pretty. But it, the students were able, and again, because they were learning in the classroom about what to expect. And so when they noticed that she was getting a little, you know, tired and they were able to adjust accordingly or knowing when perhaps the visit is not going to be a full 90 minutes, right? And then the final three set things that you see related to the program itself, some things that we weren't expecting, but they love the rapport building between the students and the family. Um, I'll show you a picture of a student who was with her family even after they were like, I know your class is ending, but we would love for you to come back and visit. And she continued her visit. Um, the reciprocity, right, that developed. So by that, I mean, the families were like, what do you, what do you like to eat? Can I pick you a cake when you come back? Like they were wanting to do something for the students as well. And then um, the program continuation, there was, Everyone expressed, can we keep this going? So as I said, we had returners, which again, for our recruitment helped, but again, we got to think about, so, but what does this, what would this look like if we were to recruit more caregivers into the program? Okay, next slide. So I'm just going to show you some representative um, quotes. So this related to the caregiver burden. This person said the whole week, everywhere I went, I was with my mother 24 seven. What I need is somebody to sit with her. Somebody you can just call and say, hey, I gotta do this. I need you to watch my mom. She said, I don't have that. 
having that extra time, this is a caregiver experience after. So I had that extra time with the ladies, the ladies I looked at, were there working with her to relax. I enjoyed reading, I would catch up on chores that I needed to do. She demands a lot of your attention. So it was good to be able to do that while they were there. Small doses of respite made this, this difference. Again, this is proof of concept. Tailored activities. It seems like the activities made him more calm. He was more cooperative. It kind of made him a little more focused. That was just incredible to hear. And then the interaction with students at the adult daycare health center. So at the center, they would say she's not calm. She's very combative, but I noticed how calm she was with them. And I think there are a couple of things related to that. First of all, there's nothing like home, right? Being in your home, being in a familiar space. But I also think that um, and, and uh, thankful for all of the adult day health programs for sure. Um, but, you know, it could for some people feel a bit redundant maybe in the activities, they're not tailored to the person, right? And so when we tailor it, we see this, oh, but when they're with her, she's not as um, combative, she's more calm. What impressed me was the students showed her love. The two young ladies were very humble kids. So here we go. This is, she wanted to do two things. She said, listen, I have been wanting to build a pond in my backyard. And when she said, I was like, wait, what? You want to build what? And she, this is what she said. And she said, I wanted to garden. I, I, she said, I know you use her words. I got to get my seeds down, right? So this was, yeah. So this was about March. So she was like, I got to get my seeds down. So when at the end of the program, she said, oh, let me take you to the backyard and show you what I did. And I had to take a picture. This was, she built this in the backyard. She said, I got to do this while the ladies were here. And then the next slide, yeah, this is the garden. She said, look, I got my seeds down. And she already had some little sprouts uh, coming up by the time. This was by the end of the semester. So this, at this point, was like around May. Um, when she um, was able to get this up. But I just love saying this because, you know, what was important to me was that the caregivers use their time for some self-identified self-care activity. Very important that they were driving here, right? That they were able to articulate what is it that I want to do, my self-care activity. Now, this, let me tell you a little bit about the courses again. The course goals identify psychosocial needs of people living with dementia and caregivers, um, assess the current community, state, and natural, national resources, demonstrate an understanding of dementia care with relevance to social work. So I was only able, I was, it was great because I was able to focus solely on dementia and caregiving, but when I embedded that content into the social work practice with older adults course, it was a little bit more broad and that it was about understanding the physical and psychosocial changes associated with normal aging, as well as understanding sort of their, their needs, of the needs of older adults. Again, training that I just did not get as a student. So that second citation where this says results, that second citation I showed you, this is where it, I was keeping a, a, like just a notebook of things that were kept happening along the way, right? And um, by the end of the second iteration, I was like, I think I have a paper. I think I need to write lessons learned on what happened. And that's exactly what I did. I was flipping through this notebook and all types of stuff um, happened. So first, this is um, one of the students' experience, right? So then there was an improvement in civic attitudes, um, improvement in attitudes toward working with people with dementia. I had a student tell me, I didn't even know I could communicate with someone with dementia. Um, so the, they identified the direct interactions as the most meaningful experience of the course. And that's just indicative of service learning. Service learning courses just have that sort of uniqueness where it tends to be that community experience that makes the difference. Um, and they all talked about how the course experience connected to their future career goals. Um, and this is next slide shows one of my students with um, this activity. So she was someone who really liked like flowers and would put out fresh flowers every day. And um, just for medical reasons, wasn't able to engage much with flowers. You see some in the background, but the students um, 
I, I guess the paper, I don't know, but they, yeah, right. So they were making artificial flowers and that was one of the activities. And then also you see the piano in the background. This is Jackie, the student, and Jackie actually was a musical person. So they were able to do music together while she was there. But Jackie is one of the students who, um, she went on to continue doing visits. And then she got like this cool job in San Francisco for some aging department. I mean, she just, she's just one of those fantastic students. And then the lessons learned. So I told you again, I was taking notes along the way, like, oh, I think I made a lot of mistakes here. What do I need to learn? Now think about this. What if you um, did your visits and your family only wanted three of the six, but then your family wanted seven, right? And I'm great. How do I grade? Right? Because this is a course, right? So how do I? What does, how do I fairly grade you comparison, right? So you did three, but your family wanted three. You did seven, which was more than what you required. Or what if your three were the full 90 minutes and your seven were just 10, 20 minutes, right? So there was a lot to figure out. But I always say that if you want to be innovative, you have to take risks. And the students were on this ride with me. So one thing that we learned was that we needed to maintain a family wait list. So the day before the visit started, um, two of the students called me and were like, uh, Dr. Washington, our person, um, there's, there was a transition and they no longer could participate in the program. I didn't have a wait list. So I didn't have a family to assign to the students. Now, again, this is a credit bearing course where I am assigning a grade. So it's like, yikes, what do you do? So we learned to keep a wait list. Um, we were able to get another family, fortunately, um, through the community partner. We also learned to update the con caregiver contact information regularly. Yeah, one student called and said, yeah, we've been calling this number and we finally got somebody. And they're like, huh, who are you looking for? Contact information was outdated. So make sure we're doing that. Um, be responsive to the community partner's needs. It, the community partner did say, hey, you know, they were... I'm able to express, yes, we will partner with you, but we kind of need certain things to happen. So, for example, the students became official volunteers of the community partner. They went through that volunteer training, which kind of took the liability off. <laughs> but they became, they got new badges and all of that stuff, but they were able to be um, participating volunteers. And so I was like, yeah, we can do that. And so the students had to, and that was part of their grade. They had to complete that volunteer training module. Encourage student flexibility with the activity. That was important because when the students were like, oh, this is not working, they were able to just kind of be flexible and think of other things that might work. Manage student family introductions. This was so important. I did not think about this, but um, we realized at the end when the families told us, well, it would have been nice to meet meet the students before they were coming out to provide, you know, this service. Like, Let's have some introduction time. I was like, yeah, that's important. That's very social work, building rapport. Didn't think about it. Um, lesson six, carefully consider the most appropriate course format. That was very important. Um, is, should it be this comprehensive gerontological social work or should it be just focused on, on dementia caregiving? And I don't know if I know the answer to that because the, all the students, again, in each course, um, reported very positive outcomes. But I do think that if I were to do this again, which you know, I'll tell you what are some of the barriers to that, but um, to, when I do this again, I would require students to take maybe gerontological social work before they take, then let's do this focused dementia caregiving experience. Um, for sure. And then finally, match students and families based on transportation needs. I had two students who didn't have cars. I was like, oh, yeah. So um, what we did was we paired those two students with um, a family that was on the bus line, right? And so they were able to ride the bus and bam, get off. By the way, um, because there was funding for this, I was able to provide students with a little bit of um, some financial support. It wasn't a lot, but it did help offset the burden, but it wasn't a lot. All right, so now back to that original question. Is the risk it? Is, can this be delivered <laughs> virtually? Is um, virtual respite a thing? So let's go back to that. Now, along came, next slide, COVID-19. This is a funny story. So I took 
the the um, findings from you know this sort of first iteration as preliminary data to submit a grant proposal. I submitted it one to the NIH it was an R21. It was scored, but it wasn't funded. So I submitted an R21. I also submitted to Alzheimer's Association, where I showed you at the beginning of the slide. And also Alzheimer's Association said, great, this is wonderful. Sure, we'll fund you because I wanted to scale the program. That was in February of 2020. <laughs> So by the next month, I had to revise my entire protocol. So literally, when I tell you this question is virtual respite thing, this is a true story. I was up late one night, and I kind of woke up, and I thought, what? What? I wonder if I can do this on Zoom. That's literally how it happened. And talk to the community partner about it. It was like, and the community partner was up for it. Because, I mean, remember at that time, a lot of service providers were transitioning to providing services online when and where they could. And so I had to go back to the sponsor, Alzheimer's Association, and I had to, you know, hey, I think I'm going to have to revise my protocol. Here's what I'm thinking. I had to get approval, had to go back to the IRB. It was a whole big thing. But then we finally got um, the approval to do exactly what I just described, but in a virtual format. And this paper is under review right now. So um, let's talk a little bit about what happened. Now, again, this is proof of concept. So right now, I am just like, does this work? It, you know, acceptability. Like, will people do it? Is it feasible? That's the only place we were. So, let me go to the next slide and let me show you. Um, and then, I think it is important. If you go back to the previous slide, I think it is important to talk about. Um, you know, during COVID, a lot of caregivers um, started to experience even more. Like what I have here, in comparison to non-caregivers, caregivers experience worse physical, mental, social, and financial health during the pandemic. And I do have these citations here. If you want to look this stuff up. COVID-19 disrupted family caregivers' use of community-based resources. So, and, 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 and my goodness, if you're in a rural community, I mean, even more so. But so how can we still get to the caregivers? How can we reach them um, in light of the, this new normal? Over 20% of older caregivers reported difficulty finding time for their self care during the pandemic. So, Google Earth, let's go to the next slide. What are you seeing here? So, I want to explain how this works. I'm watching the time. All right. Imagine this. So, you're caring for someone, and that person um, was a world traveler. This is a true story. So one person in our program, he was a world traveler. He had been all over the world. And Unfortunately, due to the dementia diagnosis, can no longer travel. You're so brilliant. The students are so brilliant. This wasn't my idea. This is their idea. So again, information gathering from the caregiver was important because we wanted to learn about the person. And um, most of these, all of these folks were early. We had one person who the caregiver described early to mid stage dementia, but they could also communicate, right? So. Um, this person said, listen, world traveler, he really was bummed out when he couldn't travel again. So the student said, why don't we take him everywhere he's been using Google Earth? And so, and so this is what it looks like. So, this, so I'm the student, I'm on the computer, this person is here. And by the way, by that point, see, this is great for me. Everyone learned how to use Zoom and FaceTime and all the things. So I didn't even have to worry about that, right? So the student is here and they're pulling up Google Earth and it's, oh, let's go to the um, Egyptian pyramids and Google Earth takes you there, right? And they were, it was fantastic. I wish this I had pictures of, this I don't have pictures of. But it was just fantastic to hear about how they were able to travel the world with this person. So this is exactly what the, the activities look like. Some were able to do, so we had one person who was like a fitness instructor before. So they did chair exercises together and they would pull them up on YouTube. They would pull up a YouTube video of a chair. Hey, let's do chair exercise. And they would, students would do it and they would do it. And you're engaging with the person. And it's like the caregiver is like, oh, okay, I'm going to step away while this is happening. And that was just, again, really fantastic. So let's go to the next slide. I just want to tell you, so this happened through J July through D December of 2021. So I did it in the summer course and then I did it in the fall course. Um, and this is very important. They didn't start the business until after it was like 
week four topic. So there were certain things that we wanted to talk about before they went out with their families and then they or went out, well, virtually connected with their families. And then they were able to contact their families and start the visit. But same thing, it was intended to have six, intended to be 90 minutes, but we really didn't know how this would work. Um, okay, so we did the same thing, these post-intervention semi-structured interviews. And next slide will show the participants. So we had nine who did this. We had one from the summer who continued into the fall semester. But we had a total of nine people. Not a lot of diversity. I'm going to talk about this because it was always intended that, hey, if we're going to do this virtual, isn't this an opportunity to really reach marginalized persons? populations. But in Georgia, we actually still have um, what they call digital deserts. Like we have folks who just don't have access to some of these things. Um, you see the dementia staging as this was as reported by the caregiver. Okay. And then um, what the relationship, I mean, primarily spousal, but we had one sister, sister um, um, relationship. Okay. And so here's what we found. The average number of visits were 4.7. The average number of respite minutes, 255 minutes, which is over four hours. And so here are some of the activities that the caregivers were able to do. Knitting, cooking, household chores, physical activities, spiritual or social activities. This is just some of what the caregivers were able to do. And the students would tell me, so I had students do visit reports that they had to upload. That was their grade. Each, each time they did a visit, they had to do a visit report. And I would read this report and um, students would say, you know, first visit the caregiver kind of hovered a little bit to make sure. But but immediately it was like, oh, I can step away and I can do my thing. And they would tell me what the caregivers were doing. Um, so some of the themes and sub themes again, we had these things and sub themes fell within two categories. One category was technology use, and one category was experience. And remember, these were the things I was focused on. Not so much the caregivers' outcomes yet, right? Or students' outcomes yet. Proof of concept. Can we do this? Um, and so we looked at acceptability, feasibility of technology, um, ease of use, appropriateness, facilitators, and barriers of using the technology. Respite versus self care, and I want to say something about that in a minute. And then activity and rapport building. So next slide is going to show you an example of the appropriateness. This person said, "I could tell he enjoyed it, so that so that made my time away better. You can relax and do what you're going to do if your care partner is okay." So we just wanted to know, you know, will is this the type of thing that if it were marketed, who would anyone sign up for this? So this was appropriateness, and then the next is ease of use. I would pretty much give my husband the link. Occasionally I would be there, especially at the beginning, to make sure that the connections were okay. And then after that, I would just leave them to their own devices. Next slide shows the facilitators of technology. So what were some of the things that helped? Again, everyone knew how to use Zoom by this point. Well, I mean, I've done Zoom with other organizations. We have got caregivers groups that we went to, and it was all on Zoom. So we pretty much, it was the same thing. The one caregiver said that her husband didn't have a problem with the iPad, but she also noted that while she doesn't know much about technology, she liked that all of them she really needed to do was turn on the iPad. All right, next was um, facilitators of uh, feasibility barriers to technology use. This is important. So this person said, usually he's scrolling with people, scrolling with people in the bottom, and then somehow it touches something and it gets cut off. But this thing is, is if he's on the iPad, you know, he touches something and it's real sensitive. So just basically saying, yeah, you know, the iPad was just kind of sensitive thing and we would touch it and then things would just um, go crazy. So I think that this really speaks to Appropriate technology, right? What makes sense for the dementia staging? The next caregiver respite. So through the intervention, though the intervention was provided virtually, caregivers were still able to do their respite stuff. This person said, so when they engaged with him virtually, I was in another room working on my art project. So that gave me a little extra time to do that. Love, love, love. Um, and then caregiver self-care. I, this person said, so when they engage with him virtually, I was in another room working on my, it's the same quote, that wasn't supposed to be the same quote, sorry. Uh, go to the next slide, the activity. Yes, here we go. I did one session, um, I walked by, 
I, it involved airplanes, and he really liked that because he used he liked that, and at that time he was also doing model airplanes. So again, they were just doing these activities virtually, which was really really good. Um, and then the rapport building. I mean, he thoroughly enjoyed it. I think he got lots, lots from it. He liked the young women. He liked talking to them. He liked that they listened to him. Like when we do medical visits over Zoom, I love this part. She said, you know, when the medical visits happen over Zoom, he just kind of doesn't participate. But he was having the conversation with them. So that part, that that part was wonderful. I love that. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit of through the discussions, through the limitations. So can a program like this contribute to general training, but also um, tear apart biases that students may experience toward people with dementia and then simultaneously offer an opportunity to give the caregivers a break? So how can create opportunities for students to serve families affected by dementia and free time for family caregivers to receive the respite visits in the virtual format. Um, and it did reduce the burden of long wait times. This sample was limited though in terms of diversity. I really wanted um, more diversity, including geographic diversity. It didn't have a lot of folks in Wolf State. Well, actually of the nine, there were five who described their setting as Wolf. The intervention can only happen when there is a corresponding course. That's a limitation because the reality of academia is not like I can just say every semester, hey, I'm doing this course, hey, I'm doing this course, hey, I'm doing this course. It's just in a word like that, as you know. So uh, it can only happen when there's a corresponding course. But then the community partner said, well, why don't we just start a volunteer pool of people who could do this? But the thing about the volunteer pool is, again, my commitment is training future social workers. I really need this to live in a core space. I'm not against it, but I'm just trying to think through how can I ensure that this is happening simultaneously. And I didn't want this to be just social workers, right? I really wanted this to be an interprofessional course. And unfortunately, it was a little bit difficult to put that, th that together. I did have math, um, MPH students in the course from when it went it virtual, but I did it for the virtual piece of it. So what's happening next? And it's good, we're good on time. We'll have plenty of time for questions. What is this next? Um, so I think that virtual house guests has a great potential for scalability. If we think about all of the allied health programs at the last count, I saw 2,600 nursing programs, 700 social work, 675 occupational therapy, and on and on. So I do think this has great potential for scalability if I were to partner with other universities and other programs. I do think now that a future randomized trial is needed to estimate the effects of the intervention, we weren't looking at outcomes. That wasn't the point of the proof of concept, but now we want to do that. We also want to know what is the dose of respite. We can't know that yet, but how much virtual respite can we give a caregiver where they truly say, yes, I was able to take a break. And um, we need to focus on recruitment and diversity. And again, engage more community and university partners. And I also want to say, that's something that's very important. You saw in the sub themes, I had respite and then I had self care activity and you're thinking that's the same thing, right? Well, no, the caregiver said respite for me is an opportunity to take a break. But my self care activity is me engaging in something that's important to me while I'm taking that break. So we made that distinction and it was very clear when we were coding the data that this, that the caregivers were like, there's respite is one thing and that's great. But to actually even be able to do this self-care activity, that's even more wonderful. I have two slides of references that I certainly will make available to you. And the last slide should show time for questions. And um, I think this QR code should take you to my like information if you um, have any follow-up questions. So thank you. Um, thank you so much. So what questions do you have for me? I think you should partner with LeapFrog, LeapPad. Oh, do you know that someone else gave me that recommendation? I didn't even think about this, but someone said, you know that these tech companies are looking for yes. partners like this. It wasn't even on my radar. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. <laughs> 
That sounds very nice. I have a question. Any uh, questions online or any thoughts? Any yeah. Uh, great experience for me. Yes. You were going to say something else? Have you ever, have you met anybody else who's like pioneering? Yes. Uh, there are some folks in Pennsylvania. Um, is it Penn State? I can't remember university. They reached out to me. There's some folks in Pennsylvania and, who are doing the same thing. Because I have my research assistant like, I need you to go into the literature right now and see is this happening anywhere. And we found, um, it, it's not published, but there's a news article, right? Yeah. And um, that news article, there's a picture of a guy sitting in front of a computer. They're doing the same thing, except it's different in that the course component does not exist. So these are like paid students at undergraduate students, um, but they are not simultaneously undergoing this training, which that part is uh, non-negotiable for me. Well, the non-negotiable is what? It is my commitment to training the future workforce. So that is for me, um, it's great that we have this, like folks who wanna do this. And I imagine that if we were to generate volunteer list through the community partner, you know, we get some folks, but I do think it's important. And, and this is just my own experience, not having general when I was an MSW student, I do think that piece is important. So that part for me is a non-negotiable. So we have a question uh, from someone on the webinar. Okay. Uh, Aaron, uh, what types of qualities did you notice led to success for the student participants in connecting with their care recipient? Flexibility. <laughs> number one and I just got really lucky with a group of students and I think the students we attract are just so open to that if you're you know doing general but they were flexible they they really were riding the wave with me and it's like okay it's okay Dr. Washington we'll figure it out so that was an important quality the flexibility and I think also just um, um, empathy um, was very important um, which isn't something that I necessarily was looking for, but again, the students were doing service, part of service learning is reflection, and the students were writing reflection papers, and they were just telling me what was changing in them as they were going through this experience. But, I, but the flexibility, which I'm pretty sure if you look at that lessons learned paper, I talk about flexibility being important. That's a great question. Thank you, Erin. So I know that it was kind of mentioned on the outline of like different things to consider, but if you have any clarity on like how to navigate the families that wanted to repeat the process versus like integrating new families, like, yeah. because I know that you want to probably integrate more families in the process, but you want to keep yeah. the families integrated still. So how do you approach that? It's that's a great question because there's a lot to think through. Yeah. And uh, what proof of concept does is it kind of reveals where are some of the recruitment challenges that you might experience. I will say that having a community partner helps because community, that's, they're like the, the, the first point of contact. Caregivers will call and say, hey, I'm a person experiencing this. What services do you provide? So recruiting through a community partner helps now, but, but, I, I am responsible for making sure that I am thinking through how my recruitment efforts increase diversity, diversity in terms of geographic diversity, um, you know, where can I reach um, families who might not be calling the Council on Aging? That's my responsibility, right? So that's something that we really have to think through. Um, the other thing I will say about recruitment, um, you know, it, it'll get tricky when we're testing effectiveness and if you, you have families returning, you want to have a comparison group. So um, you you want people to experience it, but you know you have to do some randomizing. And so just, just a lot to think through that's going to take a lot of time when we're writing a proposal for, a lot, for more funding. Um, will we do like a delayed intervention? So have a control group, but then later allow them to take the course, but then I have to make sure that my associate dean approves the course again. That, you know, so it's like all these moving parts. Um, and then there was student recruitment. I actually sent emails to through the College of Public Health, like other programs, because I wanted it to be interprofessional. I didn't want it to be just social work. Um, and so I also had to think about student recruitment. By the way, the IRB really wanted me to talk about 
um, being sure, being certain that I'm not being coercive to students, right? So in other words, what if the student says, you know, I don't want to participate in the research component of this course? Respect that, and it won't have any bearing on your grade. I just thought about that when you were talking, but yeah. Thank you. Oh, here, um, here's another question um, from Jay Sung. Is there a way to apply this model if the caregiver or patient does not speak English? Hi, Jay Sung. That's one of my doc students. Um, <laughs> good question. Um, so, I think if we were to do it virtually, Google Translate is an option. Um, and I also think again, thinking about recruitment, making sure that we can offer the program in other languages. That's probably on down the road, but I think that's a fair question. I think it's important for social workers to think about. Think about again, including diversity. But yeah, maybe Google Translate. I had not thought about that. I have an interpreter, a language interpreter. Yes, a language interpreter. Yes, exactly. A good idea. We have another question. Okay. Oh, from Aaron. What topics of training did the ACCA have uh, students engage in, and and did training include any dementia specific uh, material? Great question. So their volunteer training has to do with things like ethics, liability, um, what to do if, like, um, sort of. Not, I don't want to say emergency responsiveness, but if something happens, what, ha what, you know, who do you call? So there's this more general volunteer training. It wasn't necessarily dementia specific, although the director of nursing at the time who, de who developed their volunteer training did have, um, um, it was called 101 things activities you can do with a person with dementia, which I think is Googleable. I think I found it on Google. That piece actually was in the volunteer training. But other than that, all of the dementia content came from the course. Is there a way that there like a process that you use to pair students with families or is it just kind of randomized? I know you've talked about Love transportation, it. but and then if there's an issue like they, yeah. like, they don't match well, it's yeah. not what it seems to be. What does that look like? Yeah, great question. Um, I, I can email this to you if you want to see it, but I had a, um, a, a tell me about you uh, information sheet that the students completed before the course even started, right? So tell me what are your interests, things like that. And I was doing the same thing with the families. And so that's what I was investigating when I was doing the parent. But then there was the issue of transportation, right? And so, I mean, um, I don't know if that sheet asked about transportation the first time, but it was a lesson that I learned. <laughs> That's a great question. You see all these moving parts. Mm -hmm. How in the world do you pull something like this off? I don't know. Can you imagine doing this on a larger scale? <laughs> we have a comment from uh, Dean Curran. Uh, your course seems like a great way to way for students to integrate knowledge, research, and practice. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That's exactly what was intended. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I like missed something when I stepped out, but I know that the students, while they were engaging in the process, probably did see like the um, the effects of like the rest of care for the family. Yeah. Um, but did they ever engage in like any kind of like assessments with the caregiver themselves? Asking. Uh, no, they did not. Um, however, in the course. Um, there's assignment for doing an assessment and then doing a, um, a care plan for a family. So, and I had like a case example, imagine you had a family and it's just all these different things. You know, what would the assessment? Let's do a, sort of a mock assessment and then a care plan. So, even though they didn't do it with the families, they were learning about how to perform assessments with families affected by dementia in the course. Great question. One more thing that I thought about, um, again, thinking about lessons learned. I don't know what it was about your question that triggered this, but I also didn't think through again, they went through the volunteer training, but had a report adverse situation. And um, I had a caregiver tell me something that wasn't reported to me that. So the caregiver, the person who was doing all the makeup got into the makeup and was putting it in her mouth. 
And it just scared me so much. Like, oh my goodness. She's like, no, it's okay. It's okay. But then I really had to think about, okay, I need to have some type of better sort of channel for, um, you know, addressing those concerns, like what to tell the students to do immediately, right? Um, I don't know if they left it out. I can't remember how that happened. I think that was the first group. So it's been a couple of years. I can't remember. But um, yeah, she got into the makeup. So, uh -huh. um, for the students, have you ever tried the like what to do when it's a mandated reporting situation? That was also in the volunteer training. Yes, training. Okay. that was yes. Again, the beauty of working with the community partner is it did feel like it took some of that liability off of me because they became their official volunteers, and so um, if there was like a mandate reporting situation that was all covered in that volunteer training. Great question. And I had to do an MOU, of course, with the agency. And, oh, this is so important for anyone who's thinking about doing this. I actually even consulted with legal um, just to make sure I wasn't missing anything. If you're gonna be innovative, you have to take risks. <laughs> for the research portion, for the dementia, were you guys also looking at like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, or vascular, or was that not part of the research? It, it wasn't at the time. At the time, we did think through staging, but we were thinking early to mid. We weren't thinking other types, and I didn't have um, anyone. Um, so I did not ask, like, is it vascular dementia? Like, I did not ask what type, um, but we did not think of okay what about parkinson's or something like that we did not actually we recruited solely from caregivers who were experiencing like alzheimer's vascular dementia but it possibly you know that's what we want to f figure out we have another comment mm -hmm. in the chat from jason um i want to get involved in this practice this might mm -hmm. be a very good experience to learn uh, in the real world i got you <laughs> Thank you so much for your good questions. Yeah, I just had one more question about because um, we were talking last night at uh, dinner about uh, engaging students, these amazing students. How do we engage more social work students in the area of gerontology? That's such a yeah, good yeah. question. I do think we need programs like this. We need programs like the Hartford to return. Um, I think that we need these specialized training programs in schools of social work. Um, I, I, it doesn't hurt that I just tend to have a lot of energy. <laughs> so students want to hear, oh, you should take Dr. Washington's class. Like she's really animated. So that doesn't hurt. But um, it's, it's, I do think we need this type of specialized training. I, this is fantastic. Fantastic. We did something very similar mm -hmm. actually during the pandemic um, <clears throat> with my social gerontology class. There were some challenges, so I'd love to talk to you. Okay. Um, we partnered with an organization called For All Ages, um, and they, they have a program called TIA3, where a volunteer or a student meets either, um, mostly it was virtually, mm -hmm. virtually um, with the older adults and has tea. Yep. And there were many things that came out of the program. Um, and we had the students do it in a service learning Good. program. At yeah. least I did in the social gerontology class. We're not doing it um, now because there were some hiccups, mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, that I really could relate to it. So I think this is, there's a lot of real opportunity here and Finding the right community partner, I think, is key. Um, so it sounds like you really found a good one. And I did. I sat for the board now. Yeah. They're great. Yeah. 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 And so um, I think I think there's real opportunities. So I think that we do need to bring more of that to. And I think, you know, that kind of answers Jennifer's question too. Like, how do we get students interested? I think when there mm -hmm. is a service learning kind of component, mm -hmm. students are curious. Mm -hmm. uh, they're interested in taking potentially the mm -hmm. course more. Um, which even if they're not interested in gerontology, mm -hmm. that service learning might attract them. And so I think having programmatic things, having schools yeah. that support this kind of work is key. Mm -hmm. Also, I just think, I mean, I, I talk about this a lot in the class, it's just most of our students have had an experience either with caregiving or yes, their adult that's in their right. life. And so talking about those types of things in even our, not yep. our aging courses, 
Um, because as you said earlier, we've mm -hmm. all like I tell people like even if you're not going to be a geri you know gerontologist, you're not going to be a geriatric social worker. You will encounter older adults in your practice, That's right. right? That's right. And so if you're interested in children, so grandparent might might be a grandparent taking care of mm -hmm. grandchildren. If you're interested in medical social work, well, you will see older adults. And so I think those are all um, yeah. really important. Love what you did and have a lot of um, I'm yeah. Out to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh gosh, and, uh, just love, you said something I wanted to respond to. I'm so sorry, I said, I'm like, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's something so important that you said, and I wanted to tell you it was related to another lesson learned as you were talking. Ah, I lost it. Maybe I'll think about it later. Yeah. Oh, um, when I did it in the summer, students had nothing but time. But when I did it during the academic year, it competed with field placement. Oh, and, yeah. Yes, yeah. It did. And it's just like, I gotta go to my field placement and you're actually doing this and well, that. Thing. That's what it, those were the yeah. kind of things we're having. Yeah, it's a lot to figure yeah. out. But having support, yeah, really having cool. support from our department really, really helped. Yes. Yeah. And I know that this is um but this is made possible by a donor. A don a donor heard about my work and gave an, an extra $500 yeah. for us to continue. I mean, yeah, for us to continue it on. So when you talk about most people have experienced caregiving either directly or indirectly, yep. this yeah. touches everyone. And so that was very, very helpful. Just a, a um, alum, alum, a person heard about it. It's like, I'm going to get to this point. It was so fantastic. So thank you. We need to take this on the road. I like their entrepreneurs. I know. <laughs> Someone else was like, have you looked that tech, you know, uh, yeah. like frog. Yeah. That, yeah, that was at a conference this summer when someone told me that. Thank you very much. Any closing comments? I don't think so. Yeah, no, just um, thank you so much, Dr. Washington, thank for you. joining us. And thank you uh, for those who joined us in person and online. So we have the uh, recording of the um, webinar that we can send out to. Uh, and if you do any more entrepreneurial, will you come back? <laughs> yes, I will come back. I don't know what's going on with these days.